throughout our examination of Jesus' detailed discussion of the doctrine that we refer to as eschatology or the end times, Uh, I have warned you over and over again about the dangers associated with trying to authoritatively date the actual second coming itself. We don't know the time and we shouldn't try to date when it's going to happen. Now, this does not say that all dating or timing is wrong. Such a blank statement is not even close to being biblically justifiable. Listen to some of the statements by Christ throughout this passage that assume timing, dating, and sequence. Just listen to some of these verses. Well, phrases. Chapter 13, verse 7, Christ says, And when you hear, verse 8, these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Verse 9, but be on your guard, verse 10, and the gospel must first be preached, verse 11, and when they arrest you and deliver you, verse 14, but when you see, verse 23, I have told you everything in advance. Yeah, you're hard pressed to prove from this text that Jesus wanted nothing to do with timing and dating when it comes to these matters of his return. However, one of the most famous verses in our passage this morning seems to go in completely the different direction. In verse 32, Christ says, but of that, of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. How do these two ideas fit together? Well, there's a difference between the internal timetable of events discussed here in our text and the external dating of when these events will actually take place. Let me explain this. In looking at the, the, the verses we have studied so far, verses 1 through verse 27, it's pretty clear that the time the time of unprecedented tribulation follows after the seeing of the desolation of abomination in verse 14. And that this time is preceded by the wars and rumors of wars of verse 7 and 8. Now, if someone for the purpose of clarity would have put these events on a timetable showing them in temporal sequence, they haven't violated this text. Christ is not saying, don't know the timing or the sequence of how God is going to sum up human history. What Christ is saying is, don't put a date on it. If I was to say that these events are going to start happening on April 4th, 2024, you know I've lost my mind. I've gone beyond this text. I've done what this text has not told me to do. But if you hear me say that rumors of wars precede the abomination of desolation, and after that takes place, the tribulation will happen, and after the tribulation, the, these uh, astrological signs will take place in the heavens, the sun will go dark, the moon will turn into blood. If I say those things, I've just said what the text says. Those are in sequence, but I haven't dated them. We have to understand the difference between sequence and dating. This morning, this morning, as we continue our study of Jesus' discussion of the future program of God, we turn to the matter of the timing of Jesus' coming. The timing of Jesus' coming. In order to do this, Jesus will return to his established methodology of telling parables. Let's read these verses again, verses 20 through 32, our focus for this morning. As Jesus tells a parable, and in this parable, he he illuminates the church to understand the timing of his coming. Look at verses 20 through 32 again with me. Jesus said, now learn the parable from the fig tree. 
When its branch has already become tender and put, puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. This morning, church, we look at the timing of Jesus' return, the timing of Jesus' return. Now, if you were to pick out one term to describe the Bible and the believer's disposition towards the second coming of Christ, what would your one word be? I thought about this this week. This is the word I would pick out. I would pick the word eminent, eminent. The word eminent, according to the Oxford University Dictionary, means about to happen. About to happen. You can't read these verses and come away with the, without a perspective of the imminency of Christ's return. What we believe is that Christ is coming and he could be soon. Now, am I guaranteeing it's going to be next week? No. Am I guaranteeing it's going to be next year? No. Am I, am I guaranteeing it's going to be the next century? No. But I'm saying we live as believers with an anticipation of the coming of Christ. We're looking for it. Jesus uses a parable in order to help people to understand what their disposition should be. Let's look at that parable, verses 28 and 29, and it's... Connections. The parable itself was taken from the life cycle of a fig tree. A fig tree. Now, of course, Jesus had just engaged a fig tree. If you were to turn back to Mark chapter 11, you, didn't, you, don't, you don't need to turn there, but if you were to turn back to Mark chapter 11, you would see that Jesus cursed a fig tree and he used it, he used it as an object lesson to show his judgment on the people of Israel. And so Jesus has already engaged a fig tree. Fig trees, as we learned back in Mark chapter 11, were ubiquitous throughout this whole region. Everywhere you looked, you saw fig trees. Everybody knew, everybody knew the growth cycle of a fig tree. In fact, you probably had a fig tree, if not in your yard, in your neighbor's yard in this region. The popularity of the fig tree lent it to be used in these object lessons and in these stories, and we see Jesus doing that very thing. The first thing we see here in verse 28 is that Jesus tells the disciples he wants them to learn to learn from the fig tree. This is the first time this word learn is used in Mark, in Mark. When it says to learn, obviously it meant to come to know something through instruction. And here it referred to come to know something through instruction from the fig tree. Jesus focused his attention on the growth cycle of the fig tree. Notice he says, when its branch has already become tender and put forth its leaves. As we noted in our earlier study of the fig tree in, in Mark chapter 11, the fig tree did not have leaves when it was not bearing fruit. So when a tree was entering the part of its life cycle, when the shoots were turning into fruit, it would be full of leaves. That was the problem you remember back in Mark chapter 11. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus cursed the fig tree. Why did he curse the fig tree? Did he hate fig trees? No. Christ cursed the, the, the fig tree because the, the fig tree he saw, unlike all the other fig trees, it had leaves. They had no leaves. So Jesus went to the fig tree expecting to see fruit. Because everybody knew in that part of the world, when a fig tree was in full leaf, the way the fig tree in Mark chapter 11 was, then fruit should be found on its branches. Christ found none in Mark chapter 11, so he cursed 
the fig tree. Christ says here in verse 28, when its branch has already become tender and put forth its leaves, then you are aware of something. Notice, you know that summer is near. Now, let's say those of you who are from Atlanta, let, let, let's say you would have fallen, well, I don't want to say a coma because that'd be terrible. Let, let's say you were in a deep sleep for some reason and you didn't know where you were. You woke up and you were, you, you, you were, you were disoriented. But outside, you, you saw green pollen on your car. Would you know what time of year it was? Oh, absolutely. There's no question. There, there are certain agricultural realities that we, that we just know. If we see this, it's this time of year. And we just know that. Christ says, you know when you see a fig tree and the, and the, and the branches are tender and it's full of leaves, you know summer is right around the corner. There is an understanding you have. And when he says no, Christ, the word no here meant comprehension. It meant seeing something clearly, perceiving it as it really is. It's seeing with the mind's eye. And then, and so Christ says, you as a part of this Jewish culture know when you see the fig tree this way, you know summer is near. And then notice Christ's comparison. Even so, he says, even so, you too. The same type of insight that you have about the world, apply it to spiritual realities. Draw conclusions. When you see these things occurring, when you see these things happening, recognize something Christ says, I am near. I am near. Now, there's something about this that I want to draw, you, draw your attention to. In verse 29, Christ says, recognize. He also says, see these things. All throughout this passage, you see the word see, behold, see, behold, see, behold, over and over again. Christ uses this phraseology. What's he trying to get believers to do? To see. To look. Here's my question. Are you obeying Christ? Are you looking? The whole point of Christ here is that Christians ought to be individuals who, who are looking for these things to happen. We are to exercise observation. We should be looking at the world, observing the world, seeing how the world functions, and we should be drawing some conclusions from it. All throughout this text, Christ is, getting, is, Christ is trying to get his followers to get their eyes open to be on the watch and to look for these events to take place. You gotta have, you gotta have a forward-looking mindset when it comes to the things of Christ. The consequence of, of them seeing these events is to make the conclusion He's near. Jesus expected his followers to put two and two together, to make the link between the occurrence of these events and his appearing. A Christian not prepared to make the connections is putting his or her head in the sand and is making the false conclusion that because we don't know the exact time, we don't need to watch. Because we don't know the exact time, we don't need to be concerned about these events. Christ is saying, you got to be concerned. Just because you don't know the date of my return doesn't mean you shouldn't have your eyes heavenward. You should be looking, you should be watching, you should be trying to see, do I see any of these events or related events occurring in the world today? Jesus emphasized his nearness when the events began to compound upon each other, he says, I'll be right at the door. Although not clearly stated, uh, two things are apparent to me here. The first thing I see in this text is that we have to be watchful. We gotta be watchful. 
Is that your disposition toward, are you watchful when it comes to these things? But not only watchfulness, I also see here imminency. Imminency, it's right around the corner. Notice that we have both certain events that have to occur and imminency in the same text. Just because certain things have to occur doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't think that Christ's return is imminent. It is imminent, and we must be watchful. Now, Luke's statement is unique. Uh, I want to bring this up because Luke interjects something that we have to think about here as we try to understand this first issue of, of, uh, of this timing, of the timing. Luke says, not only, not only did Jesus indicate that he was near, but in Luke 21, verse 31, Luke made this statement. Well, Luke recorded Jesus making this statement. Christ said, recognize, when you see these events, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. So not just am I near, but the kingdom of God itself is near. Now think about that for just a moment. If the kingdom of God is near, is the kingdom of God here right now? Listen to what Christ said, Luke 21, 31, when you see these events happening, what that means is this, the kingdom of God is near. Well, if it's near, can it be here in the same sense that it's near? Hmm. Let's, let's, let's think about this for a moment. Now, some will argue that this cannot be the case, you, you, the, and, and that's because we're already in the kingdom. This is the kingdom. Now, I don't, I don't disagree with that idea. I do believe that we are in a present manifestation of the universal kingdom of God. Paul, Paul stated that. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Paul, Paul said this, For he, God, delivered us, believers, from the domain of darkness and transferred us, where? Into the kingdom of his beloved son. So you can't be biblical and argue that we're, we're not in a kingdom. This is a kingdom. We're in a kingdom right now. But let me ask you a question. If we're in a kingdom right now, and that's the end of the story, why did Jesus tell believers throughout this age that we must pray this, thy kingdom come? If the only thing we need to understand is we're in the kingdom now, end of the, end of the conversation, why is it that Christ said pray this way and part of the prayer is God please send your kingdom? What's the point? What's the, what, what is Christ getting at when he says, when you see these things happening, I'm my, I am near, I'm at the door, the kingdom is going to be coming very shortly. What does he mean by that? Now, we would describe this as the already not yet. That is a common theme. You've heard me talk about it before throughout the New Testament scriptures. What we experience in an inaugural spiritual manner through our regeneration conversion experience, we will experience in a, in, a, in a consummative physical manner at the return of Christ to the earth. You see, church, the kingdom as promised through the Old Testament was a kingdom marked by two realities. The first was it was a kingdom of complete spiritual fidelity to God. Ezekiel 36, 1 through 38, that's clear. But it was also a kingdom with all the facets of any other physical kingdom in that it replaced those kingdoms. Daniel 2, 4, 44, 45, Daniel 7, 9 through 14, Daniel 7, 23 through 28, Revelation 11, verses 15 through 18. Listen, the kingdom of God replaces the kingdom of men. If it replaces the kingdom of men, it must be like the kingdom of men. It has all the physical attributes of the kingdoms of men, but it is a kingdom that is spiritually, is spiritually vital in its relationship with God. 
This takes us back to the, 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 the split between Jesus' advent into two distinct occurrences. Remember what we learned from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Messiah was going to come and what, you, what everybody thought was one time. And when he came one time, he was going to defeat his enemies, spiritual and physical enemies, and he was going to establish his kingdom and reign on earth and, and, uh, forever and ever. That was the Old Testament mindset. Christ says, I'm not coming once, I'm coming twice. The one coming was split in two. The first coming laid the foundation for the spiritual character of the kingdom and began it being populated by spiritually alive people. The kingdom is being populated right now. You and I are in it. When you get saved, you become part of God's kingdom. You populate that kingdom. Christ laid the foundation for that population at his first coming. The second coming completes the process of its population up to that point and begins the physical aspects of the promised kingdom from the Old Testament. So his first and second coming come together to produce a universal kingdom of God on the earth with both the spiritual and physical representations communicated to us in the Old Testament scriptures and verified for us in the new. So what, we, so what Christ is saying here, if we were to put it in our language, is that what we have been praying for, thy kingdom come, Jesus says will take place when you see these series of events happening. When you, when you see these series of events unfolding, your prayers are being answered. The kingdom is coming. The parable has set the basis, the basics of the timing of the second coming and the consummation of the kingdom. Jesus turned next to those who would be alive at the occurrence of the events, which are identified as the final generation. Notice verse 30. Christ says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And the, meaning of this, the meaning of this statement is pretty obvious to the reader. The challenge is with its interpretation. When Jesus referred to this generation, to whom was he actually referring? Dr. Bach, one of my teachers, identified six different viewpoints to which this generation could refer. I'm not going to go through all six of them, uh, because some of them are kind of crazy, but I will point out three, three of the main ones. Three of the main ones. And uh, those of you who have the, the outline, you'll see the, the, the three viewpoints at the, at the bottom of your outline. Here are the three views on who the final generation is. Position number one. When, when Christ says this generation, what does he mean? He means the disciples, and they are, they are a type of the generation that will experience the events of the end times. They prefigure the generation that experiences these end times events. So when, so when Christ says this generation, he's talking about his followers, the disciples. That's his point. And those 12, really, Judas isn't saved, so those 11 prefigure, they look forward to the generation that will experience the actual return of Christ to the earth. That's position number one. Position number two, the disciples are the, the, the generation and they were alive when this event did take place, the event of AD 70. So this viewpoint says that when Christ says this generation, he's referring to the disciples and those disciples experienced the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, which is the point of the passage. And that event in AD 70 prefigures the event that will take place at the end. Notice, notice how these two viewpoints 
both have prefiguring in them. The first viewpoint is driven by a personality prefiguring. The disciples prefigure. The the second one is an event. The destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 prefigures. So both of them are prefiguring events. And then there's position number three. When it says this generation, it refers to the generation that experiences the beginning of these events who will also experience their conclusion. Those are the three main, main viewpoints. Our viewpoint as a church is the third one of these. So we view, we, our view is, is the third one. Let's, let, but let's look at these. The problem with the first view and its various forms, which are popular in dispensational circles, is that the word generation has to be stressed beyond its normal lexical meaning to come up with this viewpoint. So when the word generation is used, it means the generation at that particular point. It doesn't mean a future generation. So the word itself must mean this generation at that point. This viewpoint doesn't work because of the language. Because of the language. Normally, normally, if the word generation was to mean something other than this particular generation at that point, there'd be something in the text that would allude to that point. So this this viewpoint doesn't work. The idea that this is a reference to the disciples as a type of the generation that will experience the events at the end times. It doesn't work language-wise. Let's look at the the second viewpoint. Now, the second viewpoint, quite frankly, is better because it links properly with the meaning of the word. It fits its usual meaning. The problem with this viewpoint, however, which is popular with non, in non-dispensational circles, is, is because of the event itself. In both Matthew and Mark's texts, the events described here are clearly end times events. And we've seen that over the weeks. Luke, who we've also seen over the weeks, focuses on the AD destruction, has left that destruction by this point in his text. Luke, although he focuses on AD 70, is well past AD 70 by the time Jesus makes this statement in Luke's context. What this means is this. Matthew and Mark would be interjecting an event that they did not refer to at that point, and Luke would be returning to an event he's long past to get to that particular meaning. Either way, the context, the context makes this viewpoint untenable biblically. We are then left with the third viewpoint, the third viewpoint, and this is the viewpoint that we hold to. And this viewpoint argues that when Jesus refers to this generation, he's not referring to the disciples at all. They're not in his mind whatsoever. When Christ refers to this generation, generation, he's referring to the generation of the future that begins to experience these events. Now, individuals who hold to position one and two argue that our view is not tenable either because the word generation must refer to the generation at the time of speaking and therefore it must apply to the disciples and not to some future generation. Well, here's the problem with that, with that argument. There's something in the text that forces the reader forward. And, it's the, it, and it is the demonstrative pronoun, this. Christ doesn't just say generation, he says this generation. And by the use of the word this, Christ has done something very, very important in this text. The word this, must be defined not by the lexical meaning of generation, but by the contextual time frame of Christ's statement. Christ has fast forwarded the entire conversation to the events surrounding his second coming. Look back at verses 24, 25, 
26 and 27. Christ is focused on his second coming. When you see these things taking place, when the sun turns dark, when the moon takes, turns dark, when the stars start falling out of the heaven, then you know my coming is right around the corner. So Christ has already forwarded this whole context into the future. The word this is referring to these events surrounding the return of Christ. So when Christ says this generation, it's referring to the generation that begins to, th to see these things happening. These things referring to the events surrounding his coming. The point is, is that once the beginning of the end begins to take place, the end will come quickly within one generation. Go back to verse, go back to verse eight for just a moment. Verse eight says this, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There, there will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Normally, when somebody begins to give birth, they don't give birth indefinitely. Eventually, there's going to be a baby. Eventually. Christ, Christ's point is, is that, is that when you see these events, that future generation that sees these things unfolding, that generation will not pass away until these events are consummated. If you, if you see these things happening, if you see the abomination of desolation, if you see the tribulation, guess what? You're going to see the return of Christ. Those things will happen in one generation. This generation will see these things happen. The final generation. Christ then moves on. He gives them more important information about his coming. What else about his coming? He gives the surety of, of the promise in verse 31. You see, if you, if, you read, if you read verse 30 carefully, it's clearly a promise. Christ is promising something. These events are going to be horrific. Just imagine if you're alive when these events start unfolding. Can you imagine seeing the sun go out? Can you imagine seeing stars falling from the heaven? I mean, this is a cataclysmic time period. Christ says, hey, look, this is not going to go on indefinitely. This is a promise by Christ. Christ says, if you see these things happening, you will see the end of them as well. They're, they're going to they're gonna conclude. With my coming. So, so verse 30 is really a promise. It's a promise regarding the final generation. A promise that Christ is now going to back up. Christ, how can we trust what you just said? That if we see these things happening, they're going to be constant. How can we trust that? Verse 31 tells you how. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will not pass away. Christ here gives them the surety of his promise from verse 30. The use of heaven and earth in this manner was not unique to this particular passage. In fact, some of you may recognize Jesus' use here by his use in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, when, when, uh, when, when Christ made this statement, he said, for truly, I, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. In our text, Jesus again uses a comparative statement constructed off of heaven and earth. To the normal human experience in both the ancient world and in the modern world, the world, the creation presents itself as a permanent reality. Who, who really thinks that the earth is, is going anywhere besides the environmentalist extremists? In, in, in Genesis chapter 1, 
where God laid out the inventory of his creative work, describing what took place on each of the days, when God arrived at those elements of, 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 of what he did, there was a unique statement that described each element that had life in it in Genesis chapter 1. He made the same statement in Genesis chapter 1, verse 21, verse 24, and verse 25. Each of those verses says that each, everything that, that God made that had life in it, that it could, it, it could reproduce itself after their kind. He says, after their kind. In fact, in verse 29, he said that they had fruit yielding seed in them. What, what this says is that with or without the input of mankind, the earth was going to do its thing. Maybe not in an organized fashion, but definitely in a factual way. For that reason, when, when the world when we look at the world, the world essentially seems to us to be an unstoppable entity. It seems to be permanent. And because it seemed to be permanent, it serves as an illustration of surety. Surety. Let me show you some examples of this. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 25 and 26. I just want you to see how the Bible uses this language. It uses it to, to describe surety. In Jeremiah 33, 25 through 26, we read of God's commitment to sustain the nation of Israel. And look at, look at the language. Thus says the Lord, if my covenant, if my covenant for day and night stand not, and the fixed patterns of heaven and earth I have not established, then I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, not taking them from his descendants, rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. And by the way, it's not just exclusive, it's not just exclusive to heaven and earth being used. Sometimes only one of these is used or an aspect of them is used. Look at Genesis chapter eight. Genesis chapter eight, verse 21 and 22. We hear God make this a promise in response to Noah's sacrifice after the flood. Verse 21 and 22 of Genesis eight. And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done, while the earth remains seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease." Although heaven and earth were not used, its regular cycles were used. Turn back to Jeremiah again, this time Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Sometimes heaven and earth are divided for, from each other. So God says something about the earth and makes an application. He says something about heaven and makes an application. And in Jeremiah 31, we see an example of this. And this is a powerful argument here. In fact, I would say this is one of the most powerful arguments in all the Bible for the continuing relevance of the nation of Israel in the plan of God. Look, look, look what he says here in, in Jeremiah 31, verses 35 through 37. And just listen to this language. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who, st who stirs up the sea so, it, so its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his, is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off all the offspring of, of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. This, this biblical language is used to communicate the concept of surety, permanency. You can trust what God 
is saying. It's interesting to me. Peter used the exact same language that we see here in Mark, and he indicated that the earth is going to pass away, but it's not going to pass away by human means. In other words, I'm going to say it again, the world is going to be destroyed, but it can't be destroyed by men. I don't care what the environmentalists say. Men can't destroy it. God is the only one that can destroy it. Listen to, listen to 2 Peter 3, 10, 10 through 12. He uses the exact same language. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be, will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, on account, on, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat? The only one that can destroy the earth is God. And God said, as long as the earth stands, in Genesis 8, he says there's going to be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Those things will not cease. I don't care what man says, they're not going to cease. Now, Christ used that language. And Christ is saying this. As permanent as the earth seems to you, and it is because God is the only one that can destroy it, there is more chance of that happening than my word not coming true. Well, Christ, the world can't be destroyed. Christ, that's the point. That's the point. That's how much you can bank on what I'm saying. Christ, Christ, look, Verse 30, when you see these events happening, that generation will not pass away. How can we trust your word, Jesus Christ? Christ says, look at, the, look at the world. There's as much chance of the world going out of existence as my word not coming true. You can trust what I'm saying. Amen. The surety, Amen. the surety of his promise. When Christ gives his promise in verse 30, that these events will lead to his coming, that the generation that sees these horrible things unfolding will be the generation that experiences his kingdom. Christ backs up his word with a promise. But in spite of this level of surety, there is still something unknown, and that is the specific time. Isn't it, isn't it what you want to know? Let's be honest. I mean, I want to know when it is. What day is it? What hour? What's, what's it going to happen? That's what we really want to know. But Christ says you can't have that. Verse 32, he says, But of that day or hour, no one knows. And then he drops a bomb. Not even angels in heaven, nor the Son. But the Father alone. Hmm. The unknown nature of the, of the timing. Yeah. Now, uh, let me remind you of what we've already established up front. There is clearly, there is clearly a sequence that is explained by Jesus with these events. As you study Mark 13, as we've studied it, it's clear. We can map out the sequence of events. Certain events follow upon the heels of others. And certain things cannot happen until other, th other things take place. Christ said, verse 10, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. So, there are, so we know there are certain things that, that, that ha just have to happen. We're not, we're not surprised at that. Christ has given us those things, as he said in verse 23, I've told you in advance. But Christ now says that when it comes to pinpointing the exact time of his coming, day and hour, that can't happen. In fact, Christ claimed, look at his claim, the angels in heaven nor the Son know it. Now this statement is, God, is, is a really challenging statement. First off, 
the basics of the statement itself. The, the inclusion of angels and the son is because those are the two involved in his coming, right? <laughs> Obviously. Christ, is, the son is coming back, that's obvious. And who is he coming with? The angels. Now, if the two sets of people involved don't know, how in the world do you think you're going to know? How are you going to date it? And those involved in the coming itself are unaware of its time. It doesn't make any sense. So if they don't know, then there is no chance whatsoever for anyone else. To, I don't care what televangelist tells you, he knows the time. If the sun and the angels don't have a clue, you don't have a clue. But that leads to problems. This would seem to have some implication for the deity of Christ. I don't know if you've been following, but you ought to, you ought to, you ought to be asked some questions and you see right now. How could anything be unknown to the one who, who is himself God? Can we still maintain the view that, that look, we, we believe Jesus is God, right? Can we maintain that view? In light of this text, can we still hold to our position that Christ is God if there are certain things in which Christ is not privy to? This ought to raise some questions in your mind. If he can be God and not omniscient, is there something else about God that he cannot be and still be considered divine? What else is the Bible hiding from us? What else is Christianity talking about on both sides of his mouth about? Are our attempts, are our attempts to defend the deity of Christ actually a waste of time. When the Bible clearly says here, the son is not omniscient. This text is a difficult one. But as Brother Vern has been saying over and over again, we, can, we still believe in the, in the, in the Trinity. I, I, hear you, I hear you, brother. We, don't, we still believe in the, in the divinity of Christ. How? How do we make sense of this text? How do we understand this text in light of what we believe about Jesus Christ? Well, I do have an answer for you this morning. You, you wouldn't expect me to leave this thing out in the open. You know me well, right? <laughs> there are a number of passages that include important information on the relationship between the divine and human natures of Christ. There's a lot of important passages. I think the most important passage on this subject, because it looks at both the practical and theological issues that, that are important, is Philippians chapter 2. Uh, if, if, if not the most important, this is one of the most important texts on Christ in the Bible. We've, we've studied this text in the past. In fact, we've studied this text at great length. So I'm not going to be as long, obviously. We did six, six sermons on, on this, on verses 5 through 11. Uh, the media ministry can get those for you if you need them. But I want to, I want to focus, I want to draw from that, from that series of messages some truths that help us understand what's going on here. Within Philippians 2, Paul declared that Jesus emptied himself of the form of God in order that he might take on the form of a bondservant and be made in the likeness of man. Well, let's go ahead and read it. Let's go ahead and read it. Let's, let's turn to Philippians 2. I was just going to give you the, the conclusion, but let, let's read it so that you see I'm not making this stuff off, up, off the top of my head. Philippians 2, verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and the, who, of those who, who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, Paul declared here that Jesus emptied himself of the form of God why? In order that he might take on the form of a bondservant and be made, the text says, in the likeness of men. When the Bible says the form of God, what it's, what it's referring to is the natural form in which God exists. And what is the natural form in which God exists? God exists in the form of the Shekinah glory. That's his natural divine form. God naturally is glorious. And if Jesus appeared on earth in that glorious form, then human beings would not survive seeing him. Christ could not come down in his Shekinah glory form and you hold a conversation with him. You'd be digging a hole to get away from the glory. And not only that, if Christ was to come in that form and tell you he's a man, you wouldn't buy it. No man I know shines like that. I'm sorry. So what we see here is that Christ, who existed in the Shekinah glory form of God, because he is God, could not become a man and maintain that form. By the way, we know this is, is, is the case because in Mark chapter 9, 1 through 8, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus chose to reveal his, his true state to his disciples. So although he was a man, he peeled back his flesh, not literally, but, 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 but he... He let his form shine through his humanity. And all they could do was cover themselves. So although he was a man, he still was divine, manifested by his Shekinah glory shining out from him. But this is bigger than just Shekinah glory. Take another aspect of the divine nature, the immortality of God and his self-existence. God exists in and of himself. God is not sustained by those things that humans need to sustain their life because God is life in himself. God doesn't need anything outside of himself to make him, himself continue to exist. God is existence in himself. He's life in himself. But Jesus, to appear as a man, had to take on a human nature and thus operate in the limitations that humans have naturally to their nature. Man is present in one place. God is omnipresent. Jesus would have to therefore reduce his presence to one location while still possessing omnipresence. What? What? How can Christ be in one place and still be omnipresent? He's the God-man. He's the God-man. But not only that, Christ had to mask his true immortality and self-existence because he had to be able to die. Can God die? Can you kill God? But Christ was killed, although he's God. Although as God, Jesus needed neither rest or food to survive, what do we read of Christ in the Gospels? In John 4, after a journey from Judea through Samaria, what do we find in John 4, verses 5 through 6? So he came to a city of Samaria called Asychar, near the, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son 
Uh, Joseph and Jacob as well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Jesus was plumb tired from the journey. Although God doesn't get tired. God doesn't need rest. God doesn't need slumber. Isn't that what the Bible says? He neither slumbers or sleeps. Christ was worn out and needed a rest. Also, during his visit to Jerusalem, while walking into the city in Mark chapter 11, what do we read? Verse 12, and on, on the next day, when they had departed from Bethany, he, Jesus, became hungry. God doesn't need food to survive. Christ was starving. As the God-man, food was a necessity for his continued existence since he took on the form of a man. What we see in Philippians 2 and these other examples is that in Jesus' incarnation as lived out through his earthly ministry, the divine attributes that were particularly contrary to the human nature in either pre-glorification form or its humanity, Jesus did not express but emptied himself of them. In other words, Jesus chose not to express or communicate them. He still had them. He didn't express them. So that baby in the manger who needed his mama to give him food was at the same time sustaining the existence of his mom who was feeding him. Oh, that doesn't make sense. Thank you. I know it doesn't make sense. But the Bible says, Colossians 1, it's Christ who holds all this together. The same person who needs to eat is the eternal God who has no need of anything outside of himself. The same, the same person who is in one location at one time is the same God who is everywhere present. We see, church, that the Shekinah glory, which can never be true of humanity, and the need to not consume food or survive, was true of, which is true of God, is true of Christ, although Christ in his earthly expression expressed or communicated neither of them. This, I believe, serves as a paradigm for us in understanding what Christ meant by this statement. This statement should not shock us. At first it shocks us, but if, if we just get our biblical bearing, if, if, if we just begin to compare scripture with scripture, if, if we just inlay our mind with the Bible, we begin to make sense of what seems to not make sense. How can Christ say you don't know the time? Oh, all these other scriptures begin ought to flood our mind as we begin to see what the Bible says. It's a paradigm. Jesus was not indicating that in his pre-incarnate state, prior to the creation of the universe, that he was unaware of God's plan or implementation of it. This, as we've already established, would mean that Jesus fell short of possessing real omniscience, which would mean that he could not be God. When the incarnation took place, Jesus took on the form and ministry of a slave, committing to provide the sacrifice for humanity's sins, which necessitated that he take on humanity's nature. It's because of you that Christ became a man. You were the one that needed to die. You as a human being were the one who was in sin. You were the one who were violating God's will. The reason Jesus, who is God, had to become a man is because you as a man were failing to live according to the will and word of God. And God had a choice. Only two options. Kill you and send you to hell. That's one option. I don't like that option. <laughs> option number two, kill his only beloved son 
and apply his righteousness to you. I like that option. Can I take option two? That's what took place. And so, so Christ became a man for that purpose. Part of that nature, part of that human nature is defined by limitation. And limitation in many areas, one of them being knowledge. Knowledge. We see this early in the life of the incarnate Christ when Luke said in Luke chapter 2 verse 40, and the child, that's Jesus, continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was, up, was upon him. How in the world can God increase in wisdom when he's all wise already? Because the reason Christ was able to increase in wisdom is because he was a man as well as God. He was the God-man, and the God-man increases. Because of this, because of these self-imposed limitations, for Jesus to access and communicate this aspect of his divinity, it would have to have been part of the plan of God. Christ knew the time as God, absolutely, because he's omniscient. But for him, but for the God-man to access that time and then communicate that time to others, it would have to be part of the plan of God for that to happen. Aren't you used to reading throughout the Gospels? Christ say, I came to do the will of who? Listen to John 12. John 12, verses 48 through 50. Listen to this. <laughs> Christ says, he who, he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. And the word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative. That's what Jesus is saying. But the Father himself who sent me has given me commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Here's my point then. When Jesus made the claim that he did not know the day or the hour. His point was that in his ministry as the incarnate son, it was not the intent of the father that the revelation of that part of the plan was to be accessible to humanity in any form. Just as Jesus was hungry, thirsty, tired and only present in one place, so certain aspects of the sovereign plan were unknown to him, humanly speaking. Although he was glorious, self-existent, omnipresent, and omniscient, he emptied himself of those things to accomplish his task. Amen. That's the point. That's the point. This has got nothing to do with whether Christ is God or not. If you walk away from this passage questioning the divinity of Christ, you don't understand his purpose. It's not the divinity of Christ that's at issue. What's at issue here is the plan of God. I find it interesting that although still incarnate in heaven, after the earthly side of his ministry was completed, that these type of self-imposed limitations regarding the plan of God were no longer necessary. Notice the words of Revelation with me for just a moment. In Revelation 4, John, who had just experienced a vision regarding the things that were presently taking place, was whisked to heaven to see the things that were yet to come. That's verses 1 and, one and 2 of chapter 4. While in the throne room of God, John caught a glimpse of a book in the hand of God. I don't know, I don't know how, what, what, what did God look like when John's, I don't know what he looked like. But as John was in heaven, he saw God. 
And in God's hand was a book. And in chapter 5, verse 1 through 3, it says that there was no one found worthy enough to open up the book. Now, given the context, this book must be the book that contains the plan of God in it. That is the future aspects of human history and the will of God for the salvation of mankind. Although John began to weep over this, he was comforted by an elder who indicated that there was one person worthy to open the book. This book that unfolded the plan of God, even the coming of Christ. Well, who was this person worthy to open up this book? Just listen to John as he describes him. John, in, in, in Revelation 5, beginning in, in verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb, standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Notice the omnipresence. And he came, and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down, notice, before the Lamb having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang, not a song, a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for, for thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and thou hast made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. This one who said, I don't know the time, is the one who is worthy to open the book that has the time in it. So although we don't know the exact date and time of Jesus' coming, Jesus has exhorted us as believers to keep our eyes wide open, to be on the lookout for the events that he has described here in this text. Jesus has really honed in on why he was communicating the things in Mark 13 that he was Communicate. Why did he want us to be aware of them? The purpose for this passage was to gift believers with the events and occurrences that would enable them to identify when his return was upon them. This would allow them to operate in the world without fear and would guard them from deception. Studying this passage has made me see even more clearly why Paul listed as one of the blessings of God in Ephesians 1 the fact that God has made known to us the mystery of his will. Ephesians 1 verse 9, that's what God is doing in this text. He's revealing to us the mystery of his will. As we see the world disintegrating around us, God has enabled us to operate in the surety and promise of Christ that Jesus' words are surer than the existence of creation itself. We can trust everything that God has said through Jesus. I have no doubt that Christ is coming back. I know the world mocks, mocks me for saying that. I know the world says he's not going to happen. You've been waiting now for 2,000 years. We may wait for another 2,000, but I'm still waiting in confidence. Amen. I have no doubt, because Christ himself yes. promised it. Right. And he said, the world is going to pass away before my words pass away. And last time I checked, the world's still here. <laughs> we can be sure. We can be absolutely sure of the things that Christ has told us. Let's rest in that surety. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the sure word of Christ. We have so many Christians out there being scared half to death about Christ's coming. The way this is taught in so many places, it's, it's scary. We try to scare people. And you don't want us to be fearful. 
and you don't want us to be deceived. You have revealed your will to us. As your son said in this text, I've told you these things in advance. There's a reason you did that. I pray for us as Christians that we would rest confidently, trust you completely to fulfill your word as communicated here in Mark 13. I pray, Lord God, for anyone here this morning who has not trusted Christ. They're living on borrowed time. Christ has told us very specifically what's going to happen. We don't, have to, we don't have to make it up. We don't have to doubt it. We don't have to wonder what's going to happen. Christ has been very, very specific. I pray for anyone here this morning that doesn't know Christ, that they would turn to him before it's too late. That they, Lord God, would recognize that Christ is coming back and it's not going to be to die for sin is going to be to judge sinners. And all of us, Lord God, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are worthy of death. We thank you for those of us who have been rescued, but we pray for those who have not been rescued yet, that today they would see Christ for who he truly is. That they would repent from their sin and turn to Christ in salvation, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.